There we go. All right, all right, all right. Don't do that. Makes it worse. I can talk? All right. Whew. Where was I? Let's start over again. No, I won't. Next to my, our daughter is Andrew, and then the tall dude, that's, uh, that's our son, Daniel. Told you, his name is Daniel. That's a Daniel as well there. And uh, he's part of the core group that is visiting today. We're glad to have core here. Who is core? You'll find out. You'll find out. Wonderful group of young people who love Jesus and can't wait to share him in our community in the weeks and months to come. And then, of course, right in front of Daniel, and those of you who've been attending, you've heard me mention about Carla. It was five years ago, three days ago, was the five, fifth year anniversary of her being shot and, uh, and barely surviving and left paralyzed. So, but uh, she is a living miracle, let me tell you. She is a living miracle. She loves Jesus, serves him in her local Seventh-day Adventist church as the youth pastor, and uh, is a powerful testimony on, uh, on, on the power of God. You know, we prayed, we prayed and prayed and prayed for her legs to be restored. God had other plans. He opened the door for her to serve him in a, in a very special way that otherwise would not have opened had this not happened. So uh, it still pains us by any, all means. It pains us every time, you know, we see a photo like this. It just pains us. But uh, we have the blessed hope, the assurance that Jesus Christ is coming back and uh, will restore her whole. And she'll be able not only to walk, but to fly, I believe, uh, because we'll be able to do things we cannot do on planet Earth. Now, one person is missing from this photo, the most beautiful. You know about her, those of you who've come. You know, hey, June, did you know it was coming? You knew it was coming. So here is our granddaughter. So our, our daughter and her husband, Andrew, Lauren and Andrew, had this beautiful little girl. Isn't she the most beautiful? Oh, I think I'm going to just... You know what, I'll show you another one since you're asking. <laughs> Has your grandbaby arrived yet? Not yet. So until their grandbaby is born, this is the most beautiful one. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, she's so gorgeous. You know, my, uh, my wife, you know, often goes to visit them. They live just about five hours away and uh, visit them, I should say, visit her, visit her. And, uh, and so, you know, she chooses between husband and beautiful, gorgeous, awesome granddaughter. Now I'm gonna go with the granddaughter. <laughs> so, but I am so happy that today my wife is here in church with us. And she's seated right there in the back. She'll kill me later for pointing her out. But I am so happy that uh, my wife, Cheryl, that's her name, is here. Uh, she decided that today, this week, this next week or so, my husband is, <laughs> is where I will be. But you can't blame her. I mean, can you blame her for wanting to spend time with this beautiful little girl? I can't wait to see her at Thanksgiving. You know, when I, I look at this, I can't help but... Uh, but know that Jesus, or God, as it says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, God is what? God is love. You know, when you think of your family, when you think of your kids, when you think even of Carla in her wheelchair and what she's doing now, God is love. When you look at that beautiful little girl that uh, just uh, is, is just... so beautiful, you can't help but think that God is love. I want to pray before we really get into this hot topic. Lord, bless us. Bless us here, I pray. Just guide and direct my words. I humble myself before you. Not my words, but yours. 
Open our ears, our eyes, our hearts, I pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. Unfortunately, you know, this picture of God being loving is not the one that, that many people in church around the country over time have experienced. It's not what they've heard. What they've heard is, is a message of a, of a very harsh, and you could even say mean God. They've heard that uh, if you don't follow God, you will burn in hell forever. Forever. You've heard maybe some of you those fire and brimstone sermons. And, you know, I, I, I like to believe, and I, I do believe that it was well-meaning, well-meaning. Uh, but does God really want us to follow him out of fear? And is it really true that God will torment us in hellfire? Uh, and, and by the way, if you keep that logic, you know, the devil is going to be in hellfire and he's got the what? The, the pitchfork. Does that mean that God and the devil are in cahoots with one another? I mean, think about it. That's, that's, that's what it sure sounds like. And this whole thing has driven so many people, so many people away from, from God, so many people away from Christianity, because how can a God who says that he is love actually do something like this, and how can he partner with the devil? So today we're going to look in the Bible and see really uh, what the truth is about this, this topic, hellfire. Uh, we'll answer questions like, so what is hell? Where will it be? Uh, and when? And so let's, let's start with the first one. Uh, is there such a thing as hell? I mean, is that even biblical? Okay. Well, it is biblical. Jesus said, and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body. Where? In hell. In hell. So, we, you know, I'm just going to limit to one text. I could go on and on, and then I'd start sounding like a fire and brimstone pastor, preacher. I'm not. But it is a fact that hell and hell fire, same thing, is, is a real thing. But uh, it's been misunderstood in, in so many aspects, and today we want to clarify this. So, next question. When will this happen? When will it happen? I mean, this is a question that we want to know. Uh, so, let's go to the Bible, and I invite you to pull, pull those out, whether it's a, it's a book or your devices, and go to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. So almost at the very, very end of the Bible. All right. There we are. And it's in Revelation 20, as you're turning there, that we find this thing called the millennium. The millennium in the first few verses there. So let me be clear. You're going to start reading and say, Eve, I don't see the word millennium. And I will say, what? Are you serious? You don't see it? It is there. Well, it's not. The word thousand years is there. And, uh, and the word millennium simply means, in Latin, thousand years. So whenever you say the word millennium, you're sounding very smart because you're actually saying something in Latin. It's like, oh, this person knows Latin. I'm impressed. But really, all it is, it's thousand years. Now, you might have heard some interesting teachings about the millennium, the thousand years, that it's going to be a time, better put the right picture there, a time of peace and beauty and flowers, you could say, and, and prosperity and plenty when the saints will reign with Christ here on earth. That's, that's what I have heard being taught in many places, okay? Uh, but is that what the Bible teaches? 
So let's read now. Let's go. Verse 1. Revelation what? I just want to make sure you're there. Verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for how long? A millennium, a thousand years. Yeah, a thousand years. There you have it. Let's continue. Verse 3. And he cast him, that him would be the dragon, the devil, into a bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So here's a chart that uh, kind of explains what is happening. So at the beginning of, a, of this thousand year period, the devil is bound up, it says here. We just read it, right? Right? Thousand years. And then it, it says here that he will be released at the end of the thousand years for a little while. This is what we read. So uh, when you see this, the, these words, bottomless pit, you know, it, uh, it's, it's the same words that you find in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Uh, similar words. Uh, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, it says, you know, the earth was without form and void, and it was dark. There was darkness on the face of the deep. Uh, the, the word bottomless pit uh, comes from the word abusos, which basically means the same thing. Dark, oh, abusos. What word makes, does that make you think of? Abyss, okay, so you get the meaning. Dark, desolate, chaotic. No one is going to say, hey, let's take a stroll in the abyss. No, I don't think so. So that's where the devil finds himself in this bottomless pit, a place with, with darkness and desolation. For how long? For a thousand years. So we know where the devil is. So the question is, where are the righteous? Or in other words, where are we? I mean, I hope you count yourself among that group, right? So where are the righteous? Where are we? Let's keep reading. Verse 4, and I saw thrones and they, that would be the righteous, that would be us, sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast. This is an important matter, worship. Or his image and had not received this mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So there it talks about those who will have been resurrected, come back to life, and they're now reigning with Jesus for how long? For a thousand years. And if you look at verse 5, at the very end, it refers to, and this is the first resurrection, referring to these who have come back to life to spend a thousand years with Jesus, reigning with Him. Now, if there is a first resurrection, as we see here, if there is such a thing as a first resurrection, and I might as well put the nice photo that I have of a first resurrection, uh, that means there must be at least, there must be two resurrections. I mean, why would they talk about a first resurrection if there is no second or other resurrection. So I think it makes perfect sense. So there are actually two resurrections, and Jesus refers to them. You might not have caught this when you read the Gospel of John. Do not marvel at this. This is Jesus speaking. For the hour is coming which, in which all who are in the grace will hear His voice. How many will hear His voice? All. all. I mean, everybody. There's no exception here. Here is where it gets interesting. And come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life. of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of life. condemnation or others 
uh, refer to it, uh, the resurrection unto damnation, destruction. So, the resurrection of life is actually the first resurrection. And then the, the, the one of resurrection of condemnation is your second resurrection. All right, we're getting a picture here. Uh, and, and I know some of you are saying, okay, when are we getting to the lake of fire? That's really why I'm here. I want to hear about the lake of fire. We're getting to it. Don't worry. We're getting to it. So let's look at our chart again. So you have the first resurrection, and that happens at the second coming of Jesus Christ. We saw this in another presentation when we talked about the second coming of Jesus. We know that the, the, the dead in Christ will come back to life and join us as we are caught up together to meet him in the air. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we read there. And then we saw that there is going to be a second resurrection, okay? There is a second resurrection at the end of the thousand years, a resurrection unto condemnation. I'll touch on the holy city descends in just a moment here, but I just wanted you to, to get a, a good feel of what is going on here. So... Where are we going to be, the righteous? Let's, let's be clear that Jesus Christ comes back, and it's a fulfillment of this most beloved, beloved Bible promise. I never tire reading this promise. Jesus speaks to, to us. And, and if your heart is troubled, this is a promise for you. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ, this here is a reality. There is no question about it. That's where we be for that thousand year period. Now, what about those that are not righteous? What about those who do not decide for Jesus? What does the Bible say? It gives us a glimpse here in Revelation chapter 16, uh, 6, excuse me, when the Lord comes back, we, see, we have a, a glimpse here of their reaction when the Lord comes back. Our reaction when the Lord comes back will be, yes. Well, maybe, all right, I hope it will be, yes, the reaction of those here are, is not quite the same. So here, let's read. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Let me tell you, the coming of Jesus Christ, some phenomenal event that's going to really upset planet Earth like we've never, ever seen. And the kings of the earth and the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. They're afraid. They're not saying yes. They're like, ah, and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come. Who is able to stand? Let me ask you this. So who is able to stand? Who's able to stand? I, 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 you know, you should say, I'm planning to stand and I'll be fine on that day because, lo, here comes my salvation. You're going to be excited. So this here is what happens. The Lord returns and by the brightness of his return, the, the, the wicked, those who have chosen, not chosen God, will, will be calling for rocks and mountains to 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 hide them and to fall on them, and, uh, and essentially they're going to be slain by the brightness of his return. So the righteous go to heaven, and the wicked are essentially destroyed when he returns. And so what is left is a de desolate, desolate planet during this thousand-year period. There's many texts that I could read, but I'll spare you. I'll just shows one from Jeremiah that kind of describes what it would look like in this moment. And at that day, the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth, even to the other end of the earth. They shall 
not be lamented or gathered or buried. They shall become refuse on the ground. That's a pretty sad depiction here. So let's go back to, to Satan for a second. Uh, remember we read a moment ago that he would be bound up. Did, did you catch this? He would be bound for a thousand years. Think about this. The devil, he has only one job, one task, one thing on his mind, and that is to lead people away from God. He has one task, and that is to deceive us. He has one desire, and to make sure that we do not enjoy eternity with Jesus Christ. That is what drives him. And that's what he does with his, uh, with his cohorts. Uh, he, he does his very best to, to lead people away. Uh, and so now that all the wicked are what? Dead. Does he have anyone to deceive anymore? Absolutely not. So he's essentially in solitary confinement. And so he is bound up, you could say, by circumstances, not really by a, a real chain, by a symbolic chain. He's bound up by the fact there is absolutely no one to deceive. Have you ever used the term, I'm all tied up, you know, when someone calls you and says, hey, uh, come on over, I need you to help, I need your help with something, and you say, oh, sorry, I wish I could come, I really wish I could come, I hope you wish you could come, I really wish you could come, but right now I'm, I'm all tied up. Is it really because you're tied up? No, it's because you've got probably a big project, you're, you're moving some stuff, uh, you, you're doing something, and you cannot leave what you're doing. And so we use that term, all tied up, to refer to circumstances. So the devil, you could say, is really all tied up. What are his circumstances? He has no one to deceive. That's it. That's it. So... The devil is bound up, no one to deceive. The righteous are in heaven. And what are they doing in heaven? You know, that's probably a question we should figure out. And I saw thrones and they, that is the righteous, that would be us, Lord willing, sat on them and judgment was committed to them. So what are the righteous doing? You know, you might have thought, because that's the images that are depicted uh, either we're sitting on the cloud eating some mangoes, just chilling, or strumming a... You know, that's not what the Bible teaches. Uh, I'm sure there will be harps, and I'm sure there will be mangoes. Let me rephrase it. I sure hope there will be mangoes. I love mangoes. But it tells us here for the thousand years that that we will be judging. And you'll say, what? Look at that. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 2 and 3. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? Judge? I mean, we judges? God is the judge. So why are we judging for a thousand years? Well, think about this. You're there in heaven, and you're so glad to be with God. And you look around, and you look around, and you notice that as you look and search and search and look and search, there's some people that you thought would be there are not there. It's like, well, something's wrong. Did God get it wrong? Or there may be people, let me flip it around, there may be people you see there that are like, what is he doing here? So for a thousand years, God says, you know, I want you to, be sh to know that my judgments are right and good and correct. So here's all the evidence. Here are all the books, all the books, everything, the book, books where everything has been kept. You know, this master computer there that is far better than anything we can imagine on earth. So there it is. Go at it. So essentially, you know, we're not only judging the angels, uh, and I'm, I'm referring here to the fallen angels, but we're also judging 
God. Think about it. We're judging God. Are, was he right to allow this person into heaven? And you'll see the evidence that at one point you were unaware, but they fell in love with Jesus, gave their hearts to Jesus, and, uh, and so they're counted in as one of the saved. And you will also see some of those folks that you thought were right where they needed to be, but they had some secret things going on that they were unwilling to give up and unwilling to ask the Lord to help them with. And, and unfortunately, God pled with them over and over. And they attended meetings and they went to church. But they, they ultimately, even though they looked apart, the they resisted in their hearts Jesus Christ. And you'll say, oh, oh, that's so sad. No one will be sadder than God himself because he will have tried. He will have tried. So that's what we do in heaven. We are doing what? For a thousand years? We're judging. So let's review this. Saints are in heaven and they're judging. On earth, no one is alive. It's a desolate place except bound by circumstances is Satan. Satan. So let's go to the end of the thousand years now. Revelation chapter 20, verse 7. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. So think about this. Think about this. You know the answer already. He's released from his prison by what circumstances that have changed. We already kind of hinted at that. What circumstances have changed? The wicked have been resurrected. Hey, they're back! But the rest of the dead, just in case you didn't believe me, did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. And the first resurrection is a reference to the resurrection that took place for the righteous. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. That would be the second resurrection. That's the resurrection unto condemnation. They're back. They're back. And believe me, unlike... Unlike the righteous, when we come back to life, if we have died before Jesus comes back, uh, we're, we're going to be with beautiful, brand new uh, bodies that are going to be lasting us for forever. So they're a pretty good model. However, it's not the case here. Uh, these individuals come back to life, but they're the same old mess, same sins, same same thought pattern, same problems, same issues, same bodies. I mean, it really, nothing has really changed. And so the devil looks around, he says, okay, they're back. And, uh, and, and he goes right back to work. And what's his work? Deception, deception. Now, I want you to know know something that happens also at the end of the thousand years. I already put it on the screen there once. And I told you we'd get to it, and here we are. We get to it. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. But wait, wait, wait. Here it is. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, and it's a huge city. You read about it in, in Revelation chapter 21. It tells you how big Big this city is. It's ginormous. Coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Guess who is inside that city? All right, I like it. We got some people saying, that's us. That's our place. That's our city. That's where we have some mansions uh, prepared for us by Jesus Christ. So the city comes down. So here it is. That's going to be quite a sight. And I don't think that's even close. First resurrection happens at the second coming of Jesus Christ. For a thousand years, the earth is desolate. The devil is bound up by circumstances. There is no one, no one to deceive. Meanwhile, the righteous are in heaven and we're busy doing some reviewing of what has happened because we want to enter eternity without any doubts in our hearts. 
And at the end of the thousand years, there is a second resurrection, a re resurrection unto condemnation. The wicked are back to life. The devil is back to his old self. All right, folks. And this is also when the holy city descends from heaven. All right. And now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive. This is important. The word is there. It's repeated over and over. The nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, this is a symbolism for, for, for wickedness, to gather them together to battle whose number is as of the sand of the sea. You know, that last, those last few words are very sad. As the sand of the sea tells you, there will be a few people, a lot of people, given the opportunity but still refusing to walk with Jesus, even though he has beckoned them over and over and over again. Here's what happens next. The devil is deceiving. He's leading his forces. And here's what he tries to do. They, that is, the devil and his multitude of people went up on the breath of the and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city the new jerusalem so here they are they're surrounding the city this is uh, not a friendly visit this is not sightseeing they have a desire to overthrow god the devil still wants to be the center of attention he still wants all to worship him and so he's thinking, let's do it now. This is our chance. This is a coup attempt that we're watching here. But at this point, his, his, his time is counted. Notice what happens now. Finally, we get to the lake of fire. And fire came down from God out of heaven and did what? Devoured, Devoured them. You know, ladies and gentlemen, this... This is Revelation's lake of fire. This here, here is hellfire. And it's serious. It's very serious. Now, for us, on the inside of the city, no worries. No worries. We're safe. But, uh, but it's not going to be quite the same for those who have not made the decision to really walk with, with the Lord. You know, you may ask yourself a question here. Let me pause and say, well, maybe by then the people will have a desire to come to God. They, they realize. But the truth is, they really don't want to come to God. They really don't have a desire. So it's not like, it's not like God is, is mean, and even though they might want to come on His side, they, they, they pass that point where they're so evil that there is no desire to, to walk with God. No desire. No desire whatsoever. And so what God is doing is, is honoring their choice. Honoring their choice uh, not to, to be with Him for eternity. It tells us clearly in the Bible, Jesus said it, that the harvest, this time, is at the end of the world. So let's quickly review. And then we'll get into the lake of fire a little bit deeper. First resurrection, beginning of the thousand years. At the end of the thousand years is the second resurrection. And I hope that is clear to you. Are we good? If you're not, I'm going to go back and re restart again. <laughs> Suddenly, people are very clear. Absolutely, we're clear. Now, even though it's clear in the Bible, it, you know, what I've just shared here is not what is commonly taught. But... As you've seen, it's clearly from the Bible. I mean, we went through it step by step, very clearly from the Bible. There is no question. A friend of mine, uh, to show you what, what, what's out there, a friend of mine was traveling in Idaho a few years ago when he stopped at a payphone. That tells you how long ago that was. And when he stopped at the payphone, he found that someone had done their missionary work and had left some, some tracks there. So, you know, you can't help yourself. You see some tracks, you pick it up. It's like, oh, this is interesting. And it, one of them was a tract on, on hell. And he uh, and, 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 and started reading it, and it was about someone who claimed to have taken a guided tour of hell. 
describing this guided tour where Jesus was this person's tour guide. Let me show you around hell according to this track. And this individual says that hell is shaped like a human body and is lying at the center of planet Earth and there are snakes and oh, just horrible. Sir, could you give us the Bible references for that? No, no. I mean, it's just craziness that's out there. Now, where is hell going to take place? I mean, that's, that's a question people have. We know when it will be. It will be at the end, at the end after the thousand years. But where will it be? Will it be in the center of the earth? Uh, not quite. Not quite. But the heavens and the earth, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved, the heavens and the earth are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So it's, it's going to take place on earth, not inside of earth. And here we see, again, it's very clear. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Where are they? On planet Earth, not somewhere inside planet Earth. So the heavens and the earth are reserved for fire. So where is hellfire? On Earth. Why, Why is there a, 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 a fire that comes down? Well, think about this. Fire is something that purifies. You know, when you have fire, it just kills everything. And God really wants to end everything because he's got big plans. Before you can build something new, you've got to make sure that the old is removed. And his desire is to create a brand new planet, a new earth that is going to be even better than the one that he created in Genesis chapter 1. So here's a crucial question. Is God, God going to burn people in the fires of hell forever? You know, that's the question people ask. Is he going to do that forever? And that's, that's really a, a big deal because uh, that's where a lot of people get tripped up and say, you know, I'm done with God. Because think about this. If he burns people forever, uh, on the screen you have two gentlemen. No, they're not gentlemen. They're monsters. Let me rephrase it. Uh, you have Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler between the two of them. They caused the death of tens of millions of people. No question about it. If God burns someone forever and ever, I think it would make him more cruel than Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler. Forever. Burn forever. All eternity. If hellfire is here on earth and forever, think about this. Oops, let me go back here. How would God recreate planet earth? I mean, if, if they're burning on planet earth forever and ever, uh, when will he create the new planet? And if someone burns forever, that means they're alive forever. Where in hell? Well, I thought that only the the righteous would live forever and ever. So it sounds like, if you follow that train of thought, it sounds like even the wicked will live forever and ever, except not a very comfortable place. But still, forever and ever. So you see, it, it doesn't add up. It doesn't line up with what the Bible teaches. He who has the Son has life. Okay? Life. Life. Because if you say they're burning in hell, they still have life just in hell. And it's not very nice. He who has the Son has life. This is what the Bible teaches. He who does not have the Son of God, what does it say? Does not have life. Period. Does not have life. This is what the Bible consistently teaches. Uh, Ezekiel 18 verse 4. The soul who sins shall die. The wages of sin is death. Uh, and then, of course, in Revelation 20 verse 14, we see that uh, this, this death uh, at the end of uh, the thousand years, it's referred to as the second death. And then let me pick on the most famous Bible verse of them all. 
For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish. perish. Even right there it tells you, should not perish. That means there is not continuing of life somewhere or in some form. They just simply perish. Therefore I brought fire from your midst, and it devoured you. Fire devours anything that it, it catches. Uh, and I turned you to what? To ashes upon the earth. So when fire comes along, when it's done burning what it's burning, what's left? Ashes. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven. And all the proud, yes, all who, wicked, who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. And by the way, he does not say this with, with oh, I'm so glad. Those words are spoken with a broken, absolutely broken heart. God is not going to give immortality to those who don't love him. He's not going to say, okay, you didn't choose me. Well, then you're going to live, but you're going to suffer without end. He doesn't do this. Notice his words here. Revelation 21, verse 4. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have what? Passed away. I read here in Nahum chapter 1, verse 9, affliction will not rub a second time. It will be over. Ladies and gentlemen, God is not going to reserve a place in the universe or a place inside planet Earth, and we know that's not the case, or a corner on planet Earth where people will continue to exist, they will continue to burn, and it will be a cesspool, cesspool with, filled with sin and sinners. It just does not make sense. And think about it like this. Let's say that you are one of the righteous, and we're counting on all of you being there, and, and, and there's someone that you love so much that is not there, and you think about it, you know, I wonder how Joe is doing in his eternal fire over there. It, will, it, it just, you couldn't help, you know, you're a, a million years into eternity. It's like, oh, He's still there burning. Oh, you know, I feel, almost feel bad. I mean, was it that bad what he did? You see what I'm saying? You know, how would you enjoy eternity when you're thinking that some people you know that on earth you cared for are burning on and on? It just, it just, it just would not make no sense. So what about the term forever and ever? Well, let's, let's figure it out. Let's settle the matter here so you're clear. For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord. Therefore, turn and live. That's his desire. He wants people to live. But now let's explore the forever and ever, okay? What about that? The Bible talks about it. You know, we, we read it in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. It says, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So how do you explain that? Well, I don't have to explain it. The Bible explains it very clearly that in certain contexts, the term forever is used in a relative manner, okay? Uh, multiple times. Uh, the term forever is used in conjunction with an event that uh, does come to an end. Let me show you one. You'll be interested. This is interesting. First Samuel chapter 1, verse 22. This is the story of Hannah and Samuel. She wanted a son, and uh, God heard her prayer. She had been unable to conceive. She had a son, and here is what she said about her son Samuel. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, Not until the child is weaned. And then I will take him that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. forever. Okay. 
Then we read a little bit further. Therefore, I also have lent him to the Lord as long as he lives. Ah, he shall be lent to the Lord, so they worship the Lord there. Okay, so forever is the implication there is as long as a person lives. Okay, so it's not like, you know, you go somewhere in Israel and you find Samuel somewhere alive and still serving. No, he's, he's dead. He's awaiting the second return of Jesus Christ. Here's another one where the term forever is used. And it clarified this, this whole question about forever and this eternal fire. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. This, of course, is our friend Jonah. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever, yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. So, uh, it, it says here, uh, the, the, the bars have closed behind me for forever. Where, where did he find himself? The belly of a... All right, you stumbled upon that one. The Bible does not say whale. It could have been a whale. It could have been a whale. I'm not saying it wasn't. I'm just saying the Bible does not say that Adam and Eve ate an apple. And the Bible does not say that Jonah was in a, in a whale. It just says a large fish, okay? But once he's inside there, do you, do, can you understand that he's feeling, it felt like forever, Forever, but we know it wasn't forever. Now the Lord hath prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. So it was not forever that he found himself in there, but it felt like it. And we use the term forever ourselves in our, in our interaction with people. You know, my wife goes into the store. I don't want to go into the store with her. And I say, honey, I'll just wait in the car because... I don't like stores. And I'm not suggesting my wife likes stores. She's not one of those. But she is meticulous and careful about what she purchases. And uh, I'm waiting, and I thought it was going to just be a few moments. And, and it's a little longer, and it's a little longer. And finally, she comes back, and I'm like, You were in there forever! Have you ever said that? About someone, you know, you, uh, forever. So it's, it, it makes perfect sense. The word forever is really relative. Uh, it, you know, it depends on, on the context. Um, so when, uh, when it says they will burn forever, it means they will burn until, until they die, until they are consumed, until all that is left is ashes. The Bible also refers to an unquenchable, an everlasting, an eternal fire. Okay? Uh, so let's look about this eternal fire. We see something in Jude chapter 7. We know that Sodom and Gomorrah uh, experienced uh, this lake of fire, you could say, that came and burnt those two cities to ashes. It says here, Sodom and Gomorrah set forth as an example of suffering the vengeance of what? Eternal fire, that unquenchable, that everlasting fire. They suffered. Now, you travel to, to that area of the world, and you will see that, that there is no Sodom and Gomorrah there, and there's nothing burning there, because all you have there is the Dead Sea and ashes. And, well, not even ashes, just rocks. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. The point here is that God wants to get rid of sin. He does not want to perpetuate it. He doesn't want it to continue on and on. I think you will agree. I mean, do you want to continue dealing with with, with the mess in this world. We don't. God doesn't either. He wants to get back to his original plan. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 2. He wants a perpetuity of an eternity of just all this bliss and this peace in our midst. And if you think about it, 
you do too. You do too. 1 John chapter 5, verse 12. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I want you to think about this. You know, this is not a fire and brimstone sermon. This is just a, a presentation to reveal to you the facts. God loves you. God desires you. God has plans for you. And he will do everything and will continue to do everything possible to have us spend eternity with him. But we have a choice, a choice to make. Go ahead and that's, she was wondering, when is your, my cue? That's your cue. I want to sh- end with a, a quick illustration. And then uh, I'm going to invite you to make a decision here. In, uh, in New Zealand, there was a, uh, a young lady who was traveling on the freeway. And, you know, pretty much like 78 or 81 or 80 in our neck of the woods. And she uh, somehow was in a car wreck, single car car wreck. I don't know exactly the details, but what happened is that uh, she could not get out. She was stuck inside the car, could not get out. And to make things worse, a fire started. So you can see the trouble that she's in. Other cars pulled out and pulled off to the side and, and, and people are getting out and the fire is becoming more intense. And this young lady, essentially mostly unharmed, but unable to get out. And so all these uh, people trying to rescue her are... are even getting their their hands and their arms burnt as they're trying to pry that door open and extricate this this poor poor dying soul from from the burning car i wish this story had a good ending they were unable to do it but let me shift here a little bit Our Father in heaven watches this planet of ours. It's a mess. It's a mess. And he sent his only begotten son to rescue us. The difference between my little story and the story here, Jesus actually was able to rescue. But at the end of the day, the choice about the rescue falls on us. Do we want to be rescued? He has successfully managed to get to us. He has done what is needed as a rescuer, as a savior. The question is, will we allow him to save us? He has great plans for us. But at the same time, at the same time, God respects the choice of all. He respects our choice. And some will say, you know, no, thank you. And God says, okay. He doesn't give up, but at the end, he will say, okay, I will let you make your choice. But in his heart, man, he desires for all of us to say, yes, I want to walk with you. I want to serve you. I want to follow your Bible teachings all the way. I invite you to all to stand up. Let's all stand up. I don't know if you've noticed the tune. What does it sound like? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus because that's that's what we want to do. So I want you to open your hymnals. Uh, what, what, What number is it? 290, I think. Which one is it? Is it? It is 290. Yeah. Open to 290. And we're going to sing... The first stanza, and then we're going to, the piano will keep playing, and I will say a few more words, but 290.
Oh, I tell you what. <coughs> As you look into his wonderful face, doesn't it do something to your heart? I'll tell you this, uh, just to compare it in a very small way. I look in the face of my sweet little granddaughter and she melts my heart. She just melts my heart. When we look into the face of Jesus, oh boy, he melts our hearts. Are you looking into his face? You know, those of you who have been attending our presentations or attending Bible studies here at the Pottsville Seventh Adventist Church, you know that God is, has a plan for you. God desires you. And you know that maybe there's some things that, that uh, you need to adjust in your life. And, and, and today God is saying, I want to give you the opportunity to come forward and say, Lord, I'm going to walk with you. I don't know how it's going to work out because I don't know the future and I know that I'm dealing with some stuff in my life, uh, but I know where I want to be. I know that I want to spend eternity with you. I want to walk with you. I want to serve you. I don't have all the answers, you may say, but don't worry, God will lead and guide you one day at a time, one day at a time. So what are you going to do? Are you ready to say, Lord, it, I'm all in. I'm all in when it comes to the teachings of the Bible. I'm all in to worship you, worship you, the creator of all the universe. Worship you on Sabbath and to follow you in all the steps that I know that I need to do that. If you want to say yes to Jesus to that, loudly and clearly in front of the heavenly host, and they're here, they're watching, and, and they're, I, you know that, that he is working in your heart. You know that he's pressing you. You know that he's calling you. You know that he wants you. I want you to just come forward here. Don't worry about the other people seeing me. Don't worry. Everyone worries about themselves. It's about you. It's about you and God. It's about your future. What are you going to do? What are you going to do with all the things that you know God has placed in your heart and the opportunity that he has for you to walk with him and to live with him forever? As, uh, as we sing the next stanza, just come on forward if you feel impressed that God wants you now. Just come forward. Let's, let's go to second stanza. God wants you. Look into his beautiful face and uh, 
and you know that you can't go wrong with Jesus, he wants the best for you. He wants your joy. He wants your bliss. He wants all the good things. He wants to bestow everything upon us that is holy and good. The devil, not so. He wants us to, to miss out on all that God has in mind for us. What will you do? We're going to sing the last stanza here. Third stanza here. And there's still someone who, who needs to come up. Please do call it up and say, Lord, I want to be part of this as well. And there may be someone who needs a little encouragement. Who knows? Uh, if you have a friend who you know is, uh, is on the verge, pull them up. Hold their hand. I'm so glad that you've come forward. This is not a decision you will regret. This is a special day. Today is uh, October 21, 2023. Some of you will look back and say, you know, on that day I stepped forward. I was scared. I was scared. I was a little nervous, maybe a lot nervous, because I know that walking with God means possibly making some changes in my life. It's uh, changing my habits, uh, giving up some things. But I can assure you that whatever you give up is nothing compared to what you receive. Amen. Nothing compared to what you receive. So I want to just end with this benediction upon all of you that have come forward and all of you who are praying for those who have come forward. And this benediction is for those who still are like in the valley of decision what to do with their lives. But I want to read this, this beautiful benediction from Jude uh, verse 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, bless everyone here. Bless everyone here. May your peace be in our hearts now. We... We are thrilled and we are thankful to be, to be in your hands. And Lord, we look forward to what happens next. Lord, we pray this and we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 This does end our, our worship service, but it does not end our time here because I hear a rumor or my nose smells <laughs> a rumor.